Today, I would like to take some time to study God's Word together with the sermon titled, Who is Your Father? Let me tell you a story that happened in the United States. A single mother gave birth to a child. As he grew up, he started attending childcare, and the childcare teacher asked him, Who is your father? The child, having never seen his father before, was greatly embarrassed by the question. However, upon reaching primary school, the teacher asked him the same question. Who is your father? The child answered all other questions confidently and excelled academically. But the question, who is your father, deeply troubled his heart. He would get very distressed. It was because he had never known his father during childcare or primary school. Eventually his mother thought, my child cannot grow up properly in this environment, so she moved to another place. After they moved, their neighbors asked him, who is your father? Everywhere he went, the question, who is your father, always followed him. From then on, the child became very depressed and at times even developed symptoms of anxiety. Then, when he was about 14 years old, a new pastor was appointed to that village. When the new pastor gave a sermon during the service, he was greatly moved by it, even though he was a young boy. After the service, as he was leaving to go home, the pastor looked at him and asked, Whose son are you? When the pastor directly asked the question that had always been a source of trauma for him, he was taken aback, hesitated, and his face was flushed red. Then, seeing his reaction, the pastor told the child, You resemble your father a lot. I've never seen a child resemble his father so much. Of course, I know very well who your father is. Hearing this, the child's face began to blush even more. The pastor, while encouraging and stroking the child, said, The father I am talking about is God. You resemble God so much, and complimented him. Since that day, the child escaped from the veil of darkness. He was overjoyed to learn through the pastor that God is his father. This is a true story, not a fictional story. Thus, from that day on, the child could face people with a bright expression. He had even suffered from social phobia, but upon hearing the pastor's words that day, he realized, I greatly resemble my father, and my father is God. From that moment on, his life changed 180 degrees. Moreover, he was overjoyed, and from that point on, even when strangers asked him, Who is your father? He answered confidently, I am the Son of God. How truly wonderful is this story? When we think about how many of our beloved heavenly family members are living without fully knowing whom their father and mother are, don't we feel an urgent desire to reveal to them who their true father and mother are? Spiritually, people don't know father well. They don't know mother either. Furthermore, they are unaware of the spiritual environment they are in. If someone asks, who is your father? How can we respond? We can confidently respond by saying, my father is God. We have clear evidence given to us by father and mother. In the Bible, it is described as putting a seal. Shouldn't all of us, as members of the heavenly family, boast about Father's name and Mother's glory to the people in Samaria and to the ends of the earth, armed with this certainty? 
The subject of the anecdote I just mentioned is Ben Hooper, a governor who was elected twice in the United States. Everyone, we still have numerous brothers and sisters in this dark world. We must let them know who our father is. We must tell them, you resemble father very much. You greatly resemble mother. Isn't it necessary to let them know, your father is God, and your mother is God? Thus, what does the Bible instruct us to do? It teaches us to boast about God's name to all peoples of the world. Do not light a lamp and hide it under a bowl, but put it on its stand. It must be revealed so that all the people in the world can see and understand it. Isn't this what the Bible teaches us? Let us find evidence in the Bible that our Father is God. First, let's take a look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8. If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? We must not forget that all mankind has a human father, who gives birth to the flesh, and a father of spirits who gives birth to the spirit. To understand the spiritual world, isn't it necessary to study God's word? As we contemplate God's word, we must not deny the fact that we have a father of our spirits. We have a father of our spirits, and who else is there according to Galatians chapter 4? We have a mother of our spirits. Thus, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 17 through 18, what are we called? It says we are called God's sons and daughters. Nowadays, many churches in the world also insist that they are God's children. However, God has given us clear proof that we are his children. Father has placed his seal on our foreheads. Through what? Through the blood of the Passover. Family relationships are a bond that is formed through blood. Thus, it is commonly referred to as a blood relationship. Let's take a look at the book of Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12 verse 11, God says, This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. Verse 12. On that same night I will pass through Egypt, and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be... What is this blood? It is the blood of the Passover lamb. And what will this blood be? In the English Bible, it is written that it will be a sign. In other words, a mark or a signature. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord a lasting ordinance. Then, whose sign does the blood of the Passover lamb represent? It represents God's sign. Since it is the very signature of God, in the New Testament time, Jesus also emphasized on the Passover night, this cup is, what is it? The new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for, who is it poured out for? You. Therefore, since the blood of the Passover lamb represents God's blood, being God's signature, 
God protected those houses so that the destroying angel could not bring disaster upon them. They became the place that contained God's signature, indicating no disaster shall come upon this place. It is now sealed on our foreheads. Although we cannot see it with our physical eyes, all the destroying angels and the judging angels can see it clearly. Today, having been chosen by God, we are walking the path of faith, following the way of truth of the new covenant, the path of father, the path of mother, and the path of the king. Therefore, we should take great pride in this. If someone asks, who is your father? Do not hesitate to answer. My father is God, whose name in the age of the Holy Spirit is Christ An Sang Hong. 2,000 years ago, in the age of the Son, his name was Jesus. My father is the one who was called by the name Jehovah in the age of the Father. We should be able to say this confidently. Only those who keep the Passover have the right to call God father and mother. Let us examine this a little more. Let's move on to Matthew chapter 26. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 26 verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Verse 18. He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him. The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. Let's see the scene of keeping the Passover by turning to verse 26. Verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, it is the cup that contains the Passover wine. He took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Through the bread and wine of the Passover, Jesus reveals to us the meaning of his flesh and blood. Those who have been sealed with the blood of Christ, marked on their foreheads, must never forget that their current life is meant to be lived as a king's life. Since our Father is God, how should we live our lives? Shouldn't we live our lives worthy to be called the children of God? As father and mother's children, shouldn't the heavenly family members live a life befitting father and mother's children in their words, actions, thoughts, and all their behaviors? Let's see Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land, or on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having, what did he have? The seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Here, it shows that the angel, having the seal of God, appeared from the country in the east and commanded the four angels who had been given power to destroy the world saying, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Now, let us turn to Revelation chapter 22 about those who have been sealed on their foreheads. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 22 verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, 
as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name. Where will his name be? How did his name come to be on their foreheads? According to Revelation chapter 7, where was God's seal placed? It is written that a seal was placed on their foreheads. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. In the East, a stamp is commonly used, while in the West, a signature or a sign is usually used. Yet, it carries the same meaning. The Father's name is engraved in the stamp, and similarly, it is contained within the signature. Then, as stated in Isaiah chapter 52, what must we know if we are God's people, that is, God's children? God says, my people must know my name. Wouldn't it be a big problem if the wrong person's name was written on their foreheads? They must bear the name of God. Didn't Jesus also promise to give his new name in the age of the Holy Spirit? The name Jehovah would be engraved on our foreheads in the age of the Father, the name Jesus in the age of the Son, and the new name Ansang Hong would be engraved in the age of the Holy Spirit. To have God's name on our foreheads, what must we keep? The Passover, the Holy Blood of Christ, must be within us. This is because His blood is God's signature, written with God's name. So, referring to the Passover wine, he said, This cup is the new covenant, in whose blood? My blood, which is poured out for you. He said, This is my blood. Therefore, if those without the blood of Christ refer to God as Abba, Father, they can only be considered as false children. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 22, chapter 22, verse 3. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will, what will they do? Reign forever and ever. Not just anyone can reign, but only those with God's name engraved on their foreheads. What did God use to mark his name on their foreheads? According to Exodus chapter 12, it was the blood of the Passover lamb. God commanded them to put the blood of the lamb on the sides and tops of the door frames, and this became a sign. The blood of God enabled all disasters to pass over them. What does it represent? It contains God's name. From the words given here, we can see that those who will reign forever and ever are the ones with God's name engraved on their foreheads. Those who do not have his name will never be able to share in the glory of reigning forever and ever. Let us take a look at the words of 1 John chapter 2 regarding this matter. The book of 1 John chapter 2 verse 25. And this is what he promised us. What is it? Eternal life. The Bible testifies that God promised to give eternal life to his children. What he promised us is eternal life. Isn't this why God has granted all mankind his flesh and blood to give them eternal life and established the system called the truth of the new covenant Passover so that we can receive his flesh and blood? It is written that God's promise is only for such people. Then, through 1 John chapter 5, let us confirm the evidence of those who have eternal life and those who do not. Let's take a look at the book of 1 John chapter 5 verse 11. 
And this is the testimony God has given us. What has God given us? The testimony is that God has given us eternal life. People say many groundless stories such as, if we just believe, we will receive eternal life. However, didn't God establish the laws and regulations of the new covenant that allow us to partake in Christ's flesh and blood, rather than receiving eternal life simply by faith? What is this truth? He awakened his children to the truth of life, the Passover. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. This is written in John chapter 6, verse 54. Then, what is the testimony according to 1 John chapter 5, verse 11? What has God given us? Then, to whom does 1 John chapter 2 say this eternal life is given? Eternal life is a promise God has given to his children, and he has made it possible for us to obtain it through the Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, we can see that God commanded the blood of the Passover lamb to be applied. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7, isn't the Passover lamb referred to as Christ, our Passover lamb? Ultimately, that blood is God's sign. It is God's seal, his signature. That is why all disasters are meant to pass over, and we are able to call God Abba Father. In Revelation chapter 22, what is said to be on the foreheads of those who will reign forever in the glorious world, where there is no more death? It is written that the name of the Lamb is written on them. They must be the ones who have that name. Then, should God's people undoubtedly know God's name or not? They should indeed know it. Let's see Isaiah chapter 51 verse 7. Hear me, you who know what is right, you people who have taken my instruction to heart, who are those who know what is right and have taken the law of God in their hearts? Aren't they God's people, God's children? Do not fear the reproach of mere mortals or be terrified by their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, the worm will devour them like wool. But my righteousness will last forever, my salvation through all generations. Regarding God's children, let's continue with chapter 52 verse 5. And now what do I have here, declares the Lord. For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule them mock, declares the Lord. And all day long my name is constantly blasphemed. Therefore my people will know my name. God's children are also encompassed in the category of my people. God's children must undoubtedly know God's name. Today, when we ask the people of the world, what is the name of God in the age of the Father? Anyone who understands the Bible even slightly will say, Jehovah. What about the age of the Son? They will say, Jesus. Then what is the name of God in the age of the Holy Spirit? They don't know the answer. Isn't it just the Holy Spirit? Isn't it the Counselor? This is the response we get. We are not living in the age of the Father, nor the age of the Son, but in the age of the Holy Spirit. Then, should we know the name that God will use in the age of the Holy Spirit, or is it okay not to know the name? We should know the name. Only then will we be able to distinguish whether God's name or some other God's name is engraved on our foreheads. That is why Jesus said, No one knows my new name except the one who receives it. Not knowing the name Christ Ansung Hong, who came to this earth with a new name, would be truly a shameful thing. Wouldn't it be even more shameful if we don't know the name of Mother? That is why God tells us to boast about the name of God. Let us open Psalm chapter 20 and confirm the instruction to boast about God's name. Let's take a look at Psalm chapter 20 verse 7.
Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in. In other words, what do we boast in? The name of the Lord our God. The name Jehovah was the only name of God that had become common knowledge among everyone in Jewish society. From their perspective, those who believed in the name of Jesus seemed to belong to a new religion or even a heresy. The people of Judaism were completely unaware that the age had transitioned from the age of the Father to the age of the Son. Such is the case in this age. The age of the Holy Spirit began when the twigs of the fig tree got tender and its leaves came out. Even though that time has long passed, many people still remain unaware that the age has changed. In this age, what must we do with the name of God? We must boast about it. We must become the ones who can proudly tell all the people of the world about the fact that we have Christ Unsung Hong, our Father who came to this earth in the new name to save mankind. How much persecution did the saints of the early church endure for testifying to the name Jesus? They were often branded as heretics. They sometimes became food for lions in Roman amphitheaters, or they were burned as human torches. In spite of such trials and persecution they underwent, they were never negligent or slothful in testifying to that name, taking on trials and persecution as a glory. We can affirm this through the words written in the New Testament. The age of the Father has passed, and the age of the Son has also passed. We are living in the last age, the age of the Holy Spirit. Then, we must engrave the name of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of people, make it known, and spread it. You resemble your Father so much that I feel like I would know who He is, even without you telling me who He is. Your Father must be God then shouldn't you know the name of God? In the age of the Father, the name was Jehovah, and in the age of the Son, it was Jesus. In the last age of the Holy Spirit, He came with the new name, Christ Unsung Hong. We must become those who can proudly proclaim to all peoples the fact that Christ Unsung Hong is our Heavenly Father. Isn't this one of the missions we must undertake in the age of the Holy Spirit? Let's see one more verse in Matthew chapter 28. Let's see Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of, in what names should we baptize them? When we talk to many people, they acknowledge the Father's name as Jehovah and the Son's name as Jesus. However, they are unaware that the Holy Spirit has a name. They say, the Holy Spirit is just the Spirit. How can the Holy Spirit have a name? However, does your Bible say that the Holy Spirit has a name or not? We must neither add to nor take away from the Bible. Since it is written, the Holy Spirit has a name, then the name must exist. We must all become His heavenly children who correctly acknowledge His name and reveal the Father's glory throughout all Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Didn't we receive eternal life through the blood of Christ? Since a seal was placed on our foreheads with the blood of God, God's signature. He never forsakes us, nor gives up on us. By remaining in faith until the end, and boasting about father and mother, let us preach the new name, Christ Unsung Hong, throughout Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, just as the early church saints preached Jesus Christ at His first coming. In this age, not only the Holy Spirit has come, but also the bride is calling the children of Zion to the spring of the water of life. Hoping that all our heavenly family members will value not only Father's name, 
but also mother's name and spread the gospel in Samaria and to the ends of the earth, I would like to conclude today's sermon. Thank you very much.